this code of behavior, you might think, oh, that's great. He accepts my point of view. One of the most misunderstood words in the English language is the word interesting. So when a British person says, mm, that's interesting, what they mean is, you're an idiot. <laughs> but what other people hear is, oh, he thinks it's interesting. That's really good. And when an Englishman says, that is a very brave proposal, what he's really saying is, you're crazy. That'll never work. But the other person thinks, mm, that's good. He thinks I have courage. So this indirectness is really due to not wanting to cause offense to people, to not wanting to be rude to people. That if someone has come up with an idea, well, good on them. I personally, I think it's a terrible idea, but I don't want to rain on your parade. So I'll just say, hmm, interesting. So bear in mind that that understatement, that indirectness is something not to be sort of, that you, it means that you can't take things at face value always. You might just have to look at things like, you know, is he actually making strong eye contact with me when he says this? Or does her body language actually convey to me that she does think it's really interesting and that she is really um, motivated by what I've had to say? You might need to do a bit of reading between the lines. Uh, Francoise, I'm guessing, yeah, you are French? I'm Belgian. You're Belgian, okay. Well, there you are. You see, I've immediately insulted you. So, but yeah. uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 no. But, in, but in France, I don't know if they have this in Belgium as well. But in France, they talk about the non dit, the what is not said, and it's I'm Belgian but French speaking. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Moi aussi. <laughs> um, and it, this is a bit like that. It's you know, it's it's what isn't said. In what, in what is said between the lines. Um, secondly, being modest. Um, that says thank you for being a team player uh, under the, you can't read the uh, but um, this being modest is, is a very English thing. It's downplaying your achievements. It's, it's saying, yeah, look, I was part of the team that brought this to light. It's not seeking the spotlight for yourself. So people will, unlike, um, say North Americans who, who tend to be very strong on um, saying what they're good at and are taught that um, uh, the, the confidence to sort of stand up and be really proud of their achievements from a very early age. We don't tend to have that same style here. We are much more likely to sort of self-deprecate and to wait to be asked to show the skills that we have and to be, wait to be asked for for more detail. Um, I met someone a couple of years ago at a networking event and um, and I sort of, you know, I said, what do you do? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm very boring. I just work in banking. But actually he was like number two in the, in the, um, um, in the World Bank or something. It was just like an incredibly senior person. And he was just very, very low key about it. So, so in an interview, for example, it's, it's always quite difficult to sort of walk that line between you want to celebrate your achievements and say what you have done, but also not to blow your own trumpet too much because it is something that here we typically don't like it when people do that, when they sort of toot their own horn too loudly. So, so kind of, you know, you can scatter little breadcrumbs for people to pick up and ask you about things that you've done without just launching into a list of all your achievements. I had a, well, we had a friend who went to work in, uh, in New York and um, uh, worked in public relations and he was really under, um, he, he, he was not able to promote himself in the same way that his American colleagues did. And to the extent that when they would ask for sort of, has anyone got any experience in this? He'd be like, yeah, I, you know, I've, I've done a bit of work on that. Meaning, well, actually I've done a few years working on that, but his American colleagues thought that he was actually almost deliberately withholding skills and information that could have been helpful for them in winning pitches because he didn't self-promote in the same way that they did. And he just found it extraordinary the way that colleagues would say, yeah, yeah, me, you know, ask me, I'm really good at that. I was top of the class. And, and then when, of course, when he came back to England after working there for five years, he had to relearn <laughs> the way to behave again because all these English colleagues were going, all right, all right, settle down, you know, back in your box. 
we're also very good at employing humor here. And I say we use it a lot to self deprecate, to sort of, you know, to not take ourselves too seriously, to diffuse tension if things are getting a bit heated. Some will often crack a joke and say we use it to mock self importance and, and earnestness in others. And, and often to pretend that things aren't as serious as they are. That whole sort of stiff, British stiff upper lip and, you know, being, being calm and cool and collected, you know, in the, face of, uh, in the face of danger. It's all part of this, you know, downplaying the risks. And, uh, and humour is, is very important in, in British business places. Um, Unlike, for example, many hierarchical, much more hierarchical workplaces where joking is, is not necessarily that common and people are reluctant to perhaps make a joke about something that you know, might be taken wrongly. So this sign here, I, I love it. It makes me laugh every time I read it um, because it's, so, it's such a polite way of saying, can you just think about the effect of your body on everyone who's looking at it? So, um, you know, it's not as it's not as obvious as a sort of large person in a small bikini with a red line through it. You know, it's it's much more subtle than that. And a lot of British humour aims to pursue that sort of that, that subtlety and, and still not be too harsh. Um, a couple of other things so sort of being stoic, you know, that, oh, never mind, you know, really, it, it's nothing that. That, that, that sort of stiff upper lip, or that is interesting because the stiff upper lip is something that has been associated with the UK for, for years and years and years. And, and now we've got people like Prince William coming out saying actually the stiff upper lip is really bad psychologically. It's really damaging for people not to be able to show their emotions. So, um, but you know, people always talk about this. We mustn't grumble, you know, things could be worse. And, you know, if you're standing in a, in a, at a bus stop in the pouring rain, and someone is bound to say, oh, well, it could be worse. It could be snowing. So, <laughs> and uh, there is just that sort of that fighting spirit. And part of that being stoic, putting up with things is also not being a nuisance to other people. So you don't want to be a bother, but, you know, would you mind sort of not, you know, getting your foot off my foot or um, and they, people would rather sort of grumble about it than draw attention to themselves and making a fuss about things. And, uh, and people always say sorry, even when it's not their fault. And, and I said to Lara, who's from Wild Crew, um, <laughs> hello Lara, <laughs> that I love, she wrote me and I, she sent me an email earlier today and I wrote back saying, oh, are you Lara that used to work at the careers department? And she wrote back saying, oh, sorry, no. <laughs> and I was like, it was, I love it that she said sorry. It was just like, she didn't need to say sorry, but that's so British to say sorry for not being the Lara that I thought she was. So, so if any of you are on Twitter, I, um, I really recommend this, um, feed called Very British Problems. And this is a classic sort of conversation between two Brits of, you know, one of them saying, oh, sorry, are you in the queue? Oh no, I'm not, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> they both laugh uncontrollably. It's, it's, it's a classic English behavior to say sorry, even when it's not your fault. So that if somebody steps on my foot, I will say, oh, sorry, that my foot was in the way rather than you know them saying sorry that and then we'll both say sorry and you know so, so we're all trying terribly hard to be terribly polite all the time so obviously queuing politely is another thing that we have to learn to do when we come to England so we are very much in the blue square but I know that lots of people I talk to in their countries they're very much on the red square and they don't understand why when the bus comes along here, why they can't just all pile into the bus and, you know, why people just stand in a long line and wait patiently to get on and why they get such black looks from people when they try to get to the front of the queue. So making small talk is an important part of, of being polite to people, being able to talk to anyone. And you may have noticed that the British people, English people talk a lot about the weather. Have any of you found that so far? Yep. <laughs> it's it's because it's because weather is something that affects everybody. So for sort of as long as anyone can remember, 
English people have talked about the weather because it's something that unifies us all. So, you know, somebody who is the lord of the manor, if you like, can talk to the pig farmer about the weather. It's something that they're all experiencing. And it's a way of showing that other people's opinions and experiences are equally important. So in that way, there is such a strong sense of egalitarianism. Despite years and years of the sort of class system, there is an underlying sense that everyone is, um, is important and everyone deserves to be treated with respect. And that was actually my next question for you, was to think about, you know, what's the motivation behind all these characteristics? So you can talk if you want, but, you know, apart from from being polite sort of for the sake of it, what, what do you think is the motivation behind all these kind of behaviors? Can you unmute them then, Sonia? I've always told the ESL students, it's about like getting common ground like getting agreement with a stranger so that then you can talk about other things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just find it's a way of building rapport in a way. You find something that you've got in common and then you can go on and talk about other things. So, And say for me, it you know, it's more, first of all, it really, it's about showing respect for other people. It's an, a, about um, treating people with respect. So not surprisingly, we see a lot of these behaviors play out in the office as well. Have any of you watched The Office? It's probably a, um, <laughs> it's, it's worth watching. It's, it's only short. I think there are only six or eight episodes altogether. And it, it's absolutely, um, it, is, it is British humor at its absolute nadir. I think it is really sort of cringe worthy to watch because the, the, the character, the boss, is just so awful. Um, and hopefully it's nothing like most English offices, but it's, um, it, it's a very good sort of insight into office politics and so on here and the way that people behave and treat each other and, and, and definitely very amusing. So I'm going to talk for a bit about, you know, as I say, the things that we've seen and how they impact on um, on the manage on the on the workspace but can i again ask is anyone working here already and have they noticed any things that are really different from the countries that they come from and Sonia, you might need to unmute everyone again please actually everybody's self-muted so <laughs> anybody oh, okay. who wants to step in okay. um, is yeah, yeah. welcome to so yeah yeah okay so if anyone's, has anyone got anything they want to sort of share on this before we start? Um, hello. Uh, hello, yeah, I can share a little bit. Uh, now, currently I'm working in a primary school in the office, like an administra administrative assistant. So I think uh, the, the thing I identify is talking about the weather is the first, the easy <laughs> topic that you can yeah. refer into a conversation that is not personal, sensitive, and yeah, is a safe topic to begin yeah. a conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's talk first about management style. And as you'd expect with all that we've said so far, the management style here is very egalitarian everyone's opinion matters so not nearly as hierarchical as many other cultures so consensus is important so your boss will ask you what do you think about this they will ask you for your opinion can you contribute to this project you know what thoughts have you got to add to this and and ultimately the manager is happy if everyone is sort of owns the decision everyone buys into it that doesn't mean that they go on endlessly going round around the table and diluting things until they get to a stage where everybody agrees. The focus is definitely on results and not on sort of endless options. But there is very much an expectation that people who are part of a team will all contribute to that functioning of the team and not just you know, respond to being told what to do, but will actually work alongside the boss, working out what it is that needs to be done. 
So this illustration, I think, is, is a really appropriate one for describing a sort of English management style, that all these things is collaboration and creativity and leadership. They all come into sort of teamwork and they, at the goal for most British organisations, and I say British because I, I do think it is British here, are to have this sense of teamwork where people with different strengths work together towards the same goal. And it requires all these different aspects and therefore requires um, a, a leader who can encompass all these different inputs and not feel that they are in any way undermined by someone else's superior ability in a space. So this slide here looks at different leadership styles and some of these might be more familiar to you from the countries that you come from. So, so you can see here in the middle, you know, we're looking at, well, is the communication more focused more on asking or telling? And I'd say within England, it's very much on the asking. It's sort of, well, you know, Sonia, what do you think we could do to improve this situation? Um, or, you know, rather than saying, Sonia, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, it's actually getting your input from Sonia as well. So they, the leadership style is much more about coaching as a how can I help Cassidy to become a, a higher performer here? What skills does she need to develop? Um, how can I help her to be a more professional person here or more capable? So it's not a directive. I'm not going to say to Cassidy, I want you to do X, Y, and Z in order to give me A, B, and C. I'm going to work alongside Cassidy to help her be the kind of person that I need her to be and that hopefully suits her professional goals as well. And I'll do that by sharing stories and by, and by having a lot of dialogue with about asking her, what does she want? What does she think? I'm not just issuing instructions and hoping that she will pick it up as we go along. And I, I'm, you know, I'm interested in developing her, her capabilities and her abilities as a professional person. So I'm not just interested in getting the job done. I really want to build a sense of sort of employee engagement so that Cassidy not only develops professionally, but also feels loyalty to the organization that we're both in. Sorry to single you out, Cassidy. I, I just, for the record, I, I have no employment relationship with Cassidy. So. <laughs> Um, but, you know, some of you may have worked with, with bosses in the past who are much more like the right-hand side, which is much more um, uh, common in places like France, for example, so uh, also a number of Asian countries, this sort of issuing instruction, things that make the boss look good rather than the team look good. Um, and so... If you're used to that other style, you may think that, well, your boss here doesn't behave like a boss <laughs> because they ask you what you think and they ask you to come up with ideas. This is uh, an issue that arises often when I work with, um, with people from um, sort of Northern Asia, from India, Pakistan and so on. They're not used to being asked for their opinion. They're used to being told what to do and what to think. So when their boss here says, well, you know, can you come up with some ideas? It's like, well, why are you asking me? You know, you're the boss. You're supposed to tell me what to do, not supposed to ask me what to do. Like, what kind of a boss are you if you have to ask me? And the fact that the boss will use humor to sort of, you know, self-deprecate and, and to, you know, that the boss is prepared to use humor to sort of break up tension and to, to, to criticize people, to tease people publicly. Uh, and this whole use of a third person, you know, the English boss will hardly ever say, you must do this. They'll say things like, I wonder if we might try. And when we say we, really, that means you. But he or she is making it sound like we're all in this together. And, and to some extent, you are. This is the emphasis is very much on, on, on teams here. But obviously, people have got their individual responsibilities as well. But delegation is, is in, in, inherently um, much more low key here. It's about suggesting things. You know, perhaps you could, um, <coughs> excuse me, I wonder if we did it slightly differently. 
So not let's do this differently. I wonder if we did do this slightly differently. Do you, I hope you see what I'm getting at with this kind of coaching approach to getting you to try things a different way. And I think my experience here is that uh, bosses will assume that you are going to give this the, your best effort. So in a meeting, it's very unusual for a, a, a team leader to say, right, I need these tasks doing. So um, Victoria, I want you to do this. Francoise, I want you to do that. Uh, I can't see any more names. They've all gone off the screen. <laughs> Carlos is here somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, that, that the assumption is that you know what your workload is. And if you've got time to do this task, then you will, you will take it on. And um, that I can safely assume that you will give this project your best efforts. So. so the kind of motivation strategies, sorry, I just need to move this back again. There we go. The kind of motivation strategies that, that the bosses use are to be very approachable, easy to approach, to keep their door open. You know, you can you can go and stick your head around your boss's door anytime and say, sorry, do you have a minute? Or do you have a few minutes? Can I can we grab a coffee and I can talk to you about this? Um, in a way that you could never do in, for example, Germany or Singapore or China. Well, you can't do that. You can't go up to the boss and just stick your head around the door. It's much more formal. You have to sort of, you know, have an appointment. So um, bosses are more, I think, really encouraging here. Can I make a suggestion about this? You know, he's your boss, she's your boss, but she's saying, can you give it just a bit more thought? So that avoidance of micromanagement and of giving responsibility to individuals is very much a sort of facet of, of, of British leadership and management style. And importantly, it's okay to learn from mistakes here as well. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be chastised or punished you know, for, for making mistakes along the way. There's a real move, I think, away from this sort of, you know, well, I think the stick, you know, you all heard, I'm sure, the sort of carrot and stick approach. I don't think the stick approach has been used here for years and years and years. But carrots certainly were that incentivizing people to work hard. But now everything is about employee engagement. It's actually about building really good bonds with people so that people are really motivated to do their, their best. And using mistakes as a learning curve is is part of that there, there's no failure there's no shame in making mistakes we have all made mistakes and that's sort of the feedback sandwich you'll you'll get a lot here people will try to sort of sugar pills if they've got something unpleasant that they have to say to you they will try to sort of couch it in in positives and not just sort of come out and and say well you know there's this problem with your work and you know I don't think it's going to work out for you here sort of um so I think you always I feel like you were sort of get given a, a second chance here um and and overall there is this this striving to create a, a team ethic that people can enjoy being a part of and um, one thing I wanted to mention here was because I I had a I'm coaching a family in Brazil at the moment who are moving here oh tomorrow actually and um, we were talking about this, the fact that his relationships with his colleagues in Brazil were very close. And um, that he said it, he just had had his daughter's fifth birthday party and a lot of his colleagues from the office had come. And I said, well, that, that probably won't happen here <laughs> uh, because there, there's very little overlap between sort of the business and, and, and personal um, spheres, if you like here, there's more, in younger single, single people who will often tend to, to go out together. Um, but it's sort of like once people get married and particularly once they start having kids, it's like the, the, the space sort of the overlap shrinks. So, so people will compartmentalize a bit more here so that you have the office relationships in sort of one part of your life and your business, your personal relationships are, are in another. And of course, there is some overlap. You, of course, you're going to meet people that you particularly enjoy spending time with. And well, I met my husband at work, but most people do actually, I think, meet their partner at work. But, but typically, um, 
there is not a huge overlap when places like Malaysia and, and, and you know, Brazil, like my client, where there is much more expectation that people will have a sort of a social engagement and social relationship with their work colleagues. There isn't that here. People will be friendly, they'll be courteous, but um, not to an extent where they expect to sort of share personal lives. So um, there's very little hierarchy here. People treat each other with respect, but everybody, for example, is on first name terms. And, um, and, and experience is, is really valued, I think, valued equally to academic qualifications. So again, very different from many countries like Southeast Asian and, and Asian countries where academic qualifications are always put forward as the main reason why you might want to hire this person. But in the UK, it's, it's the other things that you've done. It's the things that you've done outside academia. It's the, it's the volunteer programs that you've been involved with. It's the, you know, being captain of the soccer team or, or whatever. So, um, so the, you know, that actually they're looking, people are looking here for people who, who are, are rounded, are good, come back, team players, are good team players, not just there to get on and work on their own in their own little silo but really able to contribute to an enjoyable workspace and a productive workspace for everybody. So I've mentioned here this last point about keeping your arguments neutral. So in line with relationships not being overly personal, there is an assumption here that if you are making an argument for a case that you don't make it too personal. It's not about, even if you were happen to be going out for dinner with someone sort of the night before, that actually this idea that you're proposing, it's actually, you will do far better if you keep it neutral. So the fact that you have a relationship with this person outside of, the work, of work is, is not really relevant. So try to keep those, those separate. Um, so a few, a, a few sort of thoughts about office etiquette. So, um, as you'd expect really with what we've talked about so far, um, people are pretty relaxed about, um, about sharing spaces. So, you know, there's an office kitchen and everybody goes in and makes their own coffee and tea and they wash up their own mug. And you see signs like this one that you know, your mother doesn't work here, clean up your own mess. That seems probably really obvious to many of us on this call, but there may well be someone who's come from a workplace where there was somebody there who made the tea and coffee. And in many offices in, in India, for example, there's still a tea boy that goes around and makes tea and coffee for everybody. And I had a, a client who moved there and um, he really did, didn't like the tea and the coffee that came around on the cart. So he took his own little Nespresso machine in and really upset the tea boy because he was actually making his own coffee so um so he ended the compromise they found was that he would sort of hand over the capsule and the boy would make the coffee using the coffee machine for him because the boy felt you know he had to be of service that was kind of his role there and the fact that Francois didn't like the coffee that he brought was almost insulting to the tea boy so we had to find a way to sort of to work that out so um but you know, there, it's it's all about equality here. It's um, um, it's sharing spaces, hot desking, particularly now. Well, COVID's created problems with hot desking, but um, you know that not necessarily having to be in the office. Um, much more. It's interesting the last six months how people have become so much more casual, really, on on Zoom calls and things. You know, and they. Um, the children coming in and dogs barking and, and interruptions happening. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we sort of ever go back to being a bit more sort of, you know, wearing, I don't know, wearing tidier clothes. Will, will we end up going to work in our, in our leisure wear? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> so people are reasonably relaxed about timing. I mean, all these things are contextual, aren't they? So if I said to a Brazilian, Oh, it's okay. You can be five minutes late for a meeting. They're like, is that all? You know, like I'm, I'm not. I'm used to being able to be an hour late for a meeting, and nobody minds that. You know, or if I said to a Japanese person, it's okay. You can be five minutes late. They'd say, well, I've never be five minutes late. I'm always fifteen minutes early. So, depending on where you come from, 
you may be comfortable with five minutes or you might think it's unforgivably rude, but that's the kind of deal here is that that roughly if sort of five minutes flex on timing. So if you're going to be more late than that, you should let people know. So I say people are, are happy to socialize. They talk about uh, the weather. They talk about what's on TV. They talk about holiday plans, those kind of things. People don't talk about money in English offices. Uh, I have had several clients from China who, um, where they are really interested in what things cost and where they ask people how much things cost. And, you know, I like that jacket. How much did it cost? And I had a French friend who was going around the office asking everyone how they voted. Because in France, everyone is very open with talking about things like that. But here you never tell anyone how you voted and you don't talk about money either. So there's a few taboo topics if you're not sure ask someone in the office you know I was thinking about having a discussion about this or you know what would you think if I asked you this you can't possibly be expected to know everything I probably the most important thing I can tell you today is to be aware of what you don't know so to recognize that you don't know what you don't know and uh, you don't want to sort of have the verbal equivalent of you know stepping on a rake and having it <laughs> bump you in the face so uh, just uh, if you're not sure whether this sort of topic is appropriate then uh, then ask someone so uh, people often go out for drinks and meals together um, I say particularly the sort of young and young singles so um, but often sort of the married and older ones will join in as well go to the pub initially there's no expectation here that the boss will pay for all the drinks. People just take it in turn and they talk about buying around. That means when it's your turn. So, you know, if someone's bought you a drink, you should um, leave. You should stay long enough to buy them a drink back. Or if you can't do that, at least to sort of, you know, get a drink in for them before you go. So, oh, here's a dog. You see, we were just talking about. Can we see your dog, Hannah? So, there we are. We were, there we are. Oh, my dog's outside the door going, yeah. It's supper time. So <laughs> I think it's great that we see all these dogs all the time now on Zoom. So <laughs> they're better behaved than the children usually. <laughs> so yeah, in the, if you don't drink alcohol, that's also perfectly fine. Don't feel at all pressured into drinking alcohol. There are plenty of people here who don't drink. And there are plenty of people who drink an awful lot with the, you know, the, the intention to get completely hammered. And you don't need to be a part of that. It's absolutely not necessary to your success. So please don't feel any pressure to do that. So there's, there's little work talk when people go to social. You know that, again, if you think about that kind of the lack of overlap between work and social, when you're out socialising, you're there to, to make friends with people. You're not there to talk about work. So um, people won't appreciate it. I mean, obviously, if someone else raises it and they ask your opinion, you're not going to make a fuss about it and say, <laughs> because that wouldn't be English to make a fuss, would it? So I mean, you're not going to sort of draw attention to the fact to say, well, I don't want to talk about work. But, you know, you can deal with the, with the conversation and, and move on. So and I put here about work life balance just to, to prompt me to sort of talk about this with you that in England, work-life balance is is really important and people are not prepared to spend their whole lives working and they're not prepared to um you know to work over the weekend and i i um i was working with an an, an indian manager a couple of years ago and uh he really didn't want to have cultural training at all he really resisted it and um finally he ended up you know signing up for it i think he was made to have it and uh, and I said, oh, how are you finding it so far? And he said, oh, I said, English people are so lazy and they're just impossible to motivate. And I said, oh, why would you say that? And he said, well, you know, the, I email them late at night when I've had an idea and they don't reply till the morning or I call them over the weekend and they don't come back to me till Monday. And so in his experience of being a, a, you know, a boss of being a manager was that you had this sort of team around you who is responded immediately and that is very much the work ethic in places like India where people work incredibly hard but they get the boss's loyalty sort of in exchange. Here when when managers try to behave like that 
it does absolutely nothing for employee engagement levels and um and people would not wouldn't they wouldn't tolerate they wouldn't want to continue to work for somebody who had those kind of expectations on them. So the idea of, of work-life balance is really important here. And again, you know, I always think that phrase work-life balance doesn't really describe it. It should be kind of work-leisure balance because actually, you know, often many of us, we love our jobs. It's not that, you know, we don't enjoy doing them, but we want to have some time when we're not actually thinking about work as well. So, so um, if you feel that, you need to ask if perhaps you are going to be in a managerial position yourself just be aware of not impinging too much on people's work-life balance because it is something that is closely guarded here um chair just a couple of slides is, is does anybody have any questions when you're right anyone okay so you can be all welcome to unmute yourselves if you want to sort of so uh, just a, a couple of slides on meetings, um, because I always think that they're, they're done quite differently in different countries and in my experience. And they're also done differently depending on whether they are internal meetings or external meetings. And uh, I often think that actually meetings would be a lot more, internal meetings would be a lot more productive if they were treated like external meetings and everybody actually came along on time and, you know, didn't necessarily bring their sandwiches and so on with them. So, um, but here though there is a focus on results of course but there's also a focus on on the process and there's a way of doing things and the process sort of has to be followed so i'm not talking about startups and and so on here but in most sort of organizations here it, there is a process that that is it, it is expected to be followed and there's a way of working through things that you need to sort of fall in with and Typically, there'll be quite a lot of planning that goes into that processing. And, um, and that is really to reduce the likelihood of failure. So in some cultures, like Australia, for example, they're very unlikely to have a plan B. They will work out everything that is needed for plan B, plan A. And then if that doesn't work, then they'll come up with plan B. But in Germany, they'll have a plan A and they'll have a plan B so that they can switch straight away to plan B if plan A doesn't work, because you wouldn't want anyone to know that plan A hadn't worked. So <laughs> you wanna be able to just slipstream into plan B sort of fairly quickly. So we tend not to have a plan B here. We have a sort of sketch of a plan B, but most of the effort is actually going into plan A. And there'll be a cautionary note about, well, if that doesn't work, you know, we can think about doing this but we typically would not go into too much planning in the eventual, you know, the eventuality of a, of a failure. So I suppose perhaps we're quite optimistic in that way. So, um, so and informal meetings, you will um, be often presented with an agenda and the discussion is sort of controlled by whoever's leading the meetings, so brought back to the agenda. As a member of a meeting, you are expected to contribute ideas, to, to make points, um, but again, make them clearly and succinctly, um, and avoid emotional argument, and, uh, and, and there is a preference for sort of evidence-based ideas rather than just, you know, I wonder if it was, it, it's very hard to say generally because there are so many different types of organizations, um, but typically I'd say that in here, there is more preference for, um, evidence-based ideas rather than sort of blue sky thinking. If you come, if you make presentations, which you know most of us are, you'll find that the British people often will start with a joke or some kind of icebreaker. It's interesting, we, we're one of the few cultures that does. And English people think that it breaks the ice to tell a joke, but many other cultures think that it's actually not professional to make a joke because this is serious stuff that we're talking about. So why would you start by making a joke? It sets the wrong expectation. So know your audience, I'd say, and also just be careful that a lot of humor doesn't really translate. So if English is your second language, and perhaps even if it isn't, um, just be 
cautious about whether your joke or your anecdote is actually going to work in this context or whether it might backfire. So, um, keep your slides fairly generic. Don't, uh, don't have too much detail on them. If people want details, you can give details in sort of appendices and things like that. But, you know, again, the difference somewhere like Germans, they will want all the data on the, on the screen so that they can see it all then and there and they can examine it all. Um, that would just kill people here. They, they don't want that. We have your, your data sort of available for sure, but, um, but don't put it all in your slides. So, uh, and remember that, you know, the, the British people typically are not ones for sort of great fanfare and, you know, yeah, that was awesome, amazing. You know, you're, you're not going to get that. You're going to get a more muted response even when they are enthusiastic. Uh, hopefully, though, you're going to get lots of questions as well, and perhaps some interruptions where people are going to challenge you sort of as you go along. So, but speaking of challenge, conflict is, is something that English people love to avoid. And um, an open conflict is always disliked. It's, um, and it's, it's not healthy. It's part of the whole stiff up lip thing. And I think it, it, you know, it is changing, but you know, it's been really interesting for me watching the whole Brexit negotiations. I would love to have been a fly on the wall in, in some of those meetings. And, um, you know, that you see the emotion on Michel Barnier when he leaves. You don't see the emotion on, on, the, on the British negotiators' faces. You know, it's, they're much more buttoned up. You see the frustration in the Europeans. It, you don't see it here. So... And the idea of having a sort of public conflict that everybody is looking in on is just awful. And, and in, a, in a workplace um, where people sort of disagree really sort of, you know, violently about things, everyone else is really embarrassed and they all sort of shuffle off and make themselves really busy at their desks and rather than sort of be part of that. So when you get people like Spaniards and, and sort of Southern Mediterranean sort of who, type people who, Will, are very emotional and you know we'll say oh you know and this is terrible and that and, and you know and you're, you're an idiot and all this but then it's it's done it's finished it's over and they think well why why is no one talking to me <laughs> you know <laughs> because you just shouted at everybody on the team and people don't, they don't appreciate that and they're not comfortable with it not used to it so so you know be aware of behaving for the situation that you find yourself in rather than the situation that you have come from and remember that the English people will like it's like everyone you know everyone wants a win-win and um actually that's not true I don't think everyone does always want a win-win I'd say the English typically they want a win-win they don't want to win-lose they don't like making other people lose so they will look for an outcome if possible they are prepared to compromise um, but I, I do notice that when the outcome, when the solution requires a conflict in order to sort of, you know, for it to change and, and move on from a status quo, there is a sort of tendency to grumble rather than and to sort of mutter about it, you know, rather than actually tackling the issue. Um, so my last slide is about networking. And, uh, and I say it's, for me, it's it's not who you know, it's who knows you. So um, it's been interesting. So I've been talking to the university, I've been part of newcomers for the last three years since I moved to Oxford. And I have spoken to, I don't know how many people at the university about providing some kind of cultural training for international students. And it has always fallen on deaf ears. And then I sent out the Patty, you seem to have frozen. Oh dear. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, Active in that way. So, and and if people, you know, if, if somebody looks like an interesting person that you'd like to, you know, spend more time with, just say, you know, could I? Would you be open to a chat on the phone? And as I said, you know, ask for advice, not for a job. Um, 
uh, see what see what comes up um, and ask them for further connections. You know, it's like, do you know anyone else, you know, in our field who might be open to a conversation and and do try to to make yourself memorable with stories and things. <laughs> I heard a great one the other day about a sales guy who who said he always had seven sugars in his coffee when he went to sales meetings. And someone had said to him, God, you know, how do you drink it? Do you really like it like that? And he says, no, I hate it. But he said, they never forget me. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, just tell a story about yourself. Uh, tell the context of what you do rather than, you know, actually what you do. And always follow up with people. Um, I help a lot of people to get connected. And uh, my husband does as well. And I, I just really appreciate it when people say, you know, not just thanks for connecting me to, you know, Jeremy, but three months later, you remember you connected me to Jeremy. Well, he actually introduced me to, to Julie and Julie's ended up offering me a job. You know, that that's really fantastic and, and make it really personal. It's, um, you know, the kind of generic emails are just a waste of your time. Uh, far better to send three really tailored messages in LinkedIn than it is to to send you know 20 that are just blanket ones so and you might be wondering what it is to kiss frogs what that means so and and what I mean is you just never know where your kind of next lead is coming from so so a bit like I always say to people when they're building personal networks is you know to to actually go to anything and everything you know you might be really interested in English literature but you go along to something at the maths institute and there may be somebody there who is married to someone who works in publishing or you know that there's just so many connections out there you just don't know who you're going to meet so be open to everything and keep kissing frogs and one of them will be a prince or a princess one day <laughs> So, Patty, did you want it now that you're on your phone, not your laptop? Um, do you want to email me your presentation and I can share screen and you can talk to it? Or would you just like to take questions at this stage? Well, that was my last slide. So, um, oh, luckily. OK, so, perfect. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, so I'm very happy to take questions. So good. And I'm happy oh, to share my slides as well with people because I just, you know, appreciate it. there was a lot mm -hmm. to take in. So. Um, so just, you know, email me and, and I'll send them to. OK, well, everybody unmute and ask away. <laughs> oh, hello. And I've got a dog, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> the dog's telling me it's supper time. So. <laughs> no, shush. So, yeah. No, no. <laughs> I have a question about uh, shift work. I'm yeah. wondering what sort of the cultural norm around, like, can I ask for different shifts? Am I, you know, supposing to talk to my coworker about, can I switch shifts with you? Or am I supposed to go up the chain and only talk to the person in charge of schedules? I don't know sort of how to approach that. Yeah, well, look, to be honest, I, I don't have huge experience in that either. But I would say that um, generally the person up the chain will not want to be um, overly bothered with all that sort of minutiae of sorting out all these different shifts. So if you talk to your colleague and they're happy to swap and then you go to your manager and say, you know, I've spoken to Bob and he's happy to swap just to let you know, then, you know, and just is that OK with you? Um, I don't think anyone would have a problem with that. So. Yeah, so that you know, that would be fine. So. Thanks. And also, you know, things like holidays and stuff. My daughter's got a job in a falafel bar, and um, she said to me she didn't think she'd be able to get Christmas off because everyone was asking for Christmas off, and they thought she thought they'd be open on um, Christmas Eve and Boxing Day, and she's in Bristol. But then she called me today to say that everyone had asked for Christmas off, and the manager decided to shut the falafel shop for four days. So. So there you go. So it can be surprised as well. So, you know, I always think you don't ask, you don't get. So. OK, lovely. Well, look, I, I know some people said they had to leave at six and if you need to go, go. Um, but look, if you're going to stay, by all means, start your video, ask, you know, start asking questions. You know, it's supposed to be an interactive session. So, yeah. 
Um, I know, uh, Patty, that um, uh, Cassidy had once asked, how did you get in? Maybe you could tell us about your work experience and your career in. in, in yeah, yeah, sure. In, you know, yeah. And how you got to, to be doing what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> nobody, nobody else is putting their hands up. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, um, so a bit of uh, a background. I am um, I am from England originally, but I have um, lived in quite a lot of different places and um, brought up in Belgium and America and um, lived in Africa and Singapore and Australia for a long time. And I worked in a completely unrelated field um, for many years in art sponsorship. And then when I needed a change, um, I started working as a relocation consultant, which was really helping people with the sort of, you know, the nuts and bolts of their moving, finding houses and schools and so on. And doing that for a few years, I realized how how ill-informed so many people were and that they literally thought that they just, if they sorted out the house, that everything else would fall into place and that they would have friends and um, that it would be easy to get a job because they already spoke the language. Or the, and there was just so little concept of how cultural differences could impact their happiness that I trained as a, as a coach, initially with a view to <laughs> helping unhappy expats. Um, uh, and then sort of that led into, well, actually, why not doing, um, why not do training um, to help people have more realistic expectations at the beginning and help them to have a better idea of, uh, of what their experience is going to be like. And so that was 2008. That I started doing that. So um, and and now I work um, probably half half with sort of expatriates moving in and out, and also um, with companies who don't necessarily have individuals moving anywhere, but they have multicultural workforces and um, need some help with, you know, getting everybody connecting and communicating. I often say what I do is I help round pegs fit into square holes. Um, because I help people understand what makes them a round peg and what makes the square hole, what makes the whole square. <laughs> and, you know, looking for that sort of sweet spot in the middle, because it's not about losing who you are in the process. It's just about working out how you can make some adaptations.